Welcome to the final week in our 5G Connection series. It's a series about discipleship and following Jesus in very practical ways. And this week it's actually gifting. And the G is gifting and it's about being connected with our calling. And what we've been doing from time to time, we've been mucking around with some uh, stories or illustrations of connection uh, from the vine early on. I remember I talked about plumbing, connection in our house. I thought of one around gifting and that's uh, the story of LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is a, a network which started in 2002 in someone's living room. And now there's 750 million people in more than 200 countries that are that are and counting that are connected to LinkedIn. And it's designed to help people connect with their voc- their vocational purpose or maybe their vocational calling or something like that. Um, People use it to find jobs, people use it to find staff, it's about connecting with colleagues, it's about upskilling, it's about sharing resources, all this sort of stuff. And it's called LinkedIn and it's it's a social network based around calling, if you like, or vocation. Now, we don't really use the word calling uh, when it comes to vocation too often, but one of the things that I wanted to do today is I actually wanted to sit in a passage in Ephesians chapter 4 because what we're going to talk about is connecting or an, uh, we're going to talk about even a network of what it is to connect with our calling by God. And part of that is involving our gifting. And I want to use Ephesians chapter 4 as a bit of a, a base in this because Ephesians chapter 4 is this amazing picture of us taking our purpose in Christ's church. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, paint a beautiful picture of the New Testament church. And, I, and Ephesians 4 is, is a, has a similar sort of feel to it. It's written by the Apostle Paul uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, and it's, it's relevant here today. And, it's, and it talks about our gifting being connected with our call, but so much more than that. Ephesians chapter 4, John Stott wrote about, and he said it's the shift from the amazing doctrine um, and uh, of Ephesians 3 and the passionate prayer of Ephesians 3 that Paul then moves to Ephesians 4 to 6. It's the practical outworking. He says these words, from doctrine to duty, from mind-stretching theology to its down-to-earth concrete implications in everyday life. I love those words. I love those words that John Stott d- d- uses to explain the move of Paul from Ephesians 1 to 3 to Ephesians 4, which we're going to sit in today. I encourage you to spend some time reading Ephesians 1 to 3, and it finishes with that extraordinary verse, that extraordinary prayer of Paul's, to measure, you can achieve immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, being established and rooted in light and the love of Christ. It's an Incredible prayer. And, and, and it's a climax to these first three chapters which explains our salvation by grace, not through works so we can't boast. Declaring us as masterpieces, inviting Jews and Gentiles to be one and, and the whole body of Christ built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. And we get to this, this spot in Ephesians 4 where we, we read these words, therefore, and then he moves on. When I thought about it, I thought before I read Ephesians, uh, part of Ephesians 4, I'm going to go through it a, a bit at a time. I thought LinkedIn is great. LinkedIn is a great illustration of working together, um, mutually uh, getting resources from each other, uh, sharing our, our gifts or our abilities with each other, uh, a place where people can hire us or a place where we can look for jobs. It's all, it's all very civilised. It's all very cool. Um, but when Paul writes about Ephesians 4, I thought it's dangerous for us to actually think of it as, oh, well, we've all got a job to do and we're going to be part of one body. And that that's all great. But there's more to it. It's not like LinkedIn. It's more like a, a, for a call, more like a Braveheart call. And if those of you who don't, don't know what Braveheart is, it was a movie uh, many years ago talking about William Wallace. It's my favourite movie. And uh, and when I read the, the call of Paul to this life of calling, it's more like that. So I thought I'd just have a bit of fun and I'll, I'll, I'll do my, my face blue like, like Mel Gibson did in the movie. But, uh, and he painted on his war paint and he stands up in front of the people of Scotland. And this, and I kind of, I, I love the energy in this. This should be the way we read Ephesians chapter four. And he turns to the, to his, to the, the people of Scotland and he says, sons of Scotland, I am William Wallace. And I see before me a whole army of my countrymen in defiance of tyranny. You've come to fight as free men, and free men you are. 
What will you do without freedom? And the reply came back, we'll run and we'll live. And he goes, I fight and you may die. But years from now, dying in your beds, would you give every day from this day to that? But just this one chance, just this one chance to say to our enemies, you can take our lives, but you'll never take our freedom. He's on a horse. He's holding his sword. He's declaring it. When I read Ephesians chapter 4, it's like Paul crying out to us, crying out to us from prison chains to take hold of the calling that God has on our life. Let's have a look at the very first verse of Ephesians 4. Therefore I, Paul says, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you, beg you, Every day from this day to that, beg you to live a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Let's read it again. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life of worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Those words... Paul utters because he's just built up in the first three chapters of Ephesians who we are through Christ by grace. And he begs us. It, 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 is, it is the Mel Gibson crying out. Would you give every day from this day, years from now, dying in your beds, would you give every day from this day to that for this chance to live a life worthy of your calling? For you have been called by God. Paul is a practitioner, not a theorist. He's not a philosopher. He's a prisoner for this life. And he pleads, he begs with us to live this called life. Gifting, our unique gifting, the way we've been wired connects us with our calling. And along the way connects us with others as we all live this calling. Our life lived in its fullness it, it is lived in this, in this divine calling of God. And Paul unpacks it in six ways. And one of them is gifting, but there are others. The first thing we, we read after he, after he cries out these words, as a prisoner serving the Lord, is we are called by God, but we're called by God to character. We read in verse 2, always be humble and gentle. This is the calling. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Now, that love is found in Christ. But what are these words? Be humble. In other words, your call, our calling, worthy of our calling means to value others. In order to have humility, we renounce self-centeredness. We're called to this gentleness or its translation, actually meekness. Is the translation. And it's about not thinking of our own personal claims of right or positions of power. In order to have gentleness, we renounce harshness and violence and demanding our own ways and oppressing of others. Patience. This is, this is about us being patient with each other. If we go back to the scripture, be patient with each other. It's about understanding others. It's about understanding others' stories. In order to have patience, we renounce the tyranny of our own agendas. In order to have patience, we choose to place others above, above ourselves. We listen. Forbearance. This allowance for each other's faults or forbearance is a, is a word that's used to translate it. And one of the things I heard many years ago was someone said to me, don't judge others' weaknesses by your strengths. And that really struck home for me. Forbearance is to understand, again, understand the story of others. Understand that others', others weaknesses or, or struggle areas and, and bear with each other, it says. That's the call of God. That's what it is to live a life worthy of the calling. Allowance for each other's faults. Renouncing our own rights. Why? And it goes on for each other's fault because of your love. The final quality in this character, called to the character of God. 
It's it's a bit of a bookend in in, in chapters in chapter four one to sixteen, which we're looking at today. It, the whole thing finishes with this this call, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's why we use our gifts. That's why we live with character. So the whole body is filled with love. And the beginning of it, it's this. It's it's our motivation. We read is because of your love. Be be humble. Be gentle. Be patient with each other. Make allowances for each other because of your love. So our first calling, life worthy of the call. Called by God is called by God to character. The second part of it is we're called by God to the unity of Christian faith. We're not just called to be good people. And these are good qualities. These are qualities we just read. But we're actually called to be in Christ together. Because he goes on, he says, make every effort. Be zealous. Make every effort. To keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there, and here's where this unity of faith kicks in. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called, there's that called again, to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. It started to make every effort. Follow our calling with zealousness. That's why I didn't just use LinkedIn as an illustration. And that's why I use Braveheart as more of a, that's what this is about. A zealousness, a fire in our heart, a fire in our soul around the character of God, the calling of God, called to that, but also around our Christian faith together. Together. A call to this unity. We read in the, that passage we just read, the word one appears seven times. Uh, we see a very Trinity role in this. It's one, where the oneness of the Trinity. Verse four, in, we have one spirit. Verse five, one Lord, which is Christ. And verse six, one God and Father of all. One body, it says. Which we know when Paul is talking about the body, he's always talking, he talks about the, he's talking about the church. One baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Jews or Greeks, slave or free. We are one baptism. We are united in Christ. Already, Paul in chapter 2 of Ephesians has expressed the unity that comes between Jews and Gentiles. And that was a battle. But it's a fight that we're called to by God. Verse 6 reminds us when we look at that, uh, who is over God and our Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. Verse 6 reminds us of what Scott shared last week from Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, 16. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the first born, of, born over all creation. For in him all things were created. That includes us. Things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers, authorities. And I love this phrase. All things have been created through him and for him. So to live a life worthy of the calling, together, together, we live out our devotion to Jesus. We live out our devotion to the Christian faith. We live out together an understanding that every part of our being, all that we are in Christ, has been created by God, by Jesus, for Jesus. That includes all our talents and our gifts and our abilities. It includes our, our, our character. It includes every part of us. That's what it is to live a life worthy of the call. Goes on. We're called by God. So I've, I've started by saying we are called by God to character. We are called by God to unity of the Christian faith. We are called by God under the authority of Christ Jesus. Paul goes on a little further and he says, however, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Now I'm going to bring, come back to that because Paul takes a bit of a segue at this point. And he says, that is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This, mere, this clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. I could talk about Christ being over all things for like for so long right now. Um, but Paul, he just makes, makes this segue in the middle of actually talking about us as a body of Christ, talking about us living out a calling, he makes this segue to, uh, to, to re reinforce to us that the gifts that are given to build Christ's church, so that, that Jesus has all authority over all things. And he sacrificed his life for that. He descended and gave his life for that. Now, many have talked about that. What is that? What does descended and ascended mean? Um, 
it basically, we know it means Lord of all. And it's, there's been different uh, descriptions about what Paul might have been saying, but there's no conclusiveness around it. Um, some have said it's, it's about him descending into Hades. Others have said about uh, him being descended to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. But what we, we do know out of this is that Paul is saying Christ is over all things. That he might fill the entire universe with himself. And that is that should build passion in us. Let's make sure the church doesn't just function as a team. It's good. Team is good. LinkedIn is good. But fighting for the for Christ and the freedom that he has for this world and the salvation of all. Christ desires that all would be saved and all have eternal life. Now that decision will be made. People will make that decision whether they will. But we're our calling is to live live out that life worthy of the calling of which Paul says, I am in prison in chains for this, and I beg you to live this way. The fourth thing that we read is that, it, it, that Paul sort of starts that is this calling by God to engage in the diversity of our gifting. He's already started, already started in verse 7. It said, however, he has given each of us a special gift to the generosity of Christ. You notice this just follows after he was saying we're all one and there's one faith and one baptism and there's one God. We've been called to one body and one spirit. We're one glorious hope, all those oneness. But the beauty of this is we are actually called to our diversity in that. And that's what this G is all about. Our gifting connects us with our calling. Yes, our gathering connects us with each other, but inside that, there is a gifting that each of us has. And we read, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists and the pastors and teachers. And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. So there's this diversity. There's this unique gifting that we've all been given. Like we could go into Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Peter 4, go into these other passages on gifting, which talk about us coming together as one body, but under understanding our diversity so after speaking about oneness it's important that we know and i've read these words that we know that we are not a lifeless colorful a lifeless colorless uniformity imagine if we all um had clear skin coloring we were just clear um God, God, God has not designed us that way. We have, we have different cultures and different backgrounds. We have different, we have different personalities. We have different skin colorings. We have all sorts. Imagine how, and, and, and Paul's wrestling with this with Jews and Gentiles. We have different experiences and, but we're all one. We're all one. And that is God's design for us to be one, but bringing our uniqueness into that. Imagine if we all had the same thought about things all the time. Well, that's not God's design. God's design is for us to, each of us to bring a word or, or a hymn or a song it talks about when we gather together. And in this, it says a special gift or a grace or the Greek word says a charis. On Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, a, char- a charismata, our gifts. Each of us in living a life worthy of the calling must pursue an understanding of how the Holy Spirit has gifted us. When we look at these fivefold gifting, the apostles, uh, that, that they, 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 the definition of an apostle is a sent one. Uh, there, there was the original apostles, which, which were sent, which, which established that people, Jesus said to them, the, the, the disciples said, he says, he, uh, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And then we read in Acts 2, we, 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 they devoted themselves, verse 42, to the apostles' teaching. So we had the original apostles. But as, as time has gone on, uh, people are often, there, there are people who have been sent to do new works. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the, the descript- too, 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 too deep a description. Um, of that apostolic ministry. But the church needs people who actually break new ground. The prophets, the prophets in the New Testament, they had the, they, they had the gift of insight into either a biblical text where they call the people back to the biblical text. Or, or they'd have a gift of insight into a contemporary situation. Or both, how the Bible and, 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 the, and, the, and the world around intersects. 
Evangelists are generally those who are focused outside the church, reaching the unreached for the gospel, often in really contextual ways so that, that people could understand the good news in their, in their context. Pastors had that sense of shepherding, caring and protecting and growing and discipling the, the, the flock, just like, just like our good shepherd that we read about in John 10. And teachers, um, this passage, some say is connected to pastors, but there's also a unique gifting in teaching because we see that in the other spiritual gift passages where this, the teaching gift is, is, is bringing revelation through the, through the scriptures to the body of Christ, for the, for the maturity of the body of Christ. These gifts or roles that Christ gave the church have the calling to equip the people of the body of Christ, to use their diverse gifting, to live a life worthy of the calling. So it's it's not just about apostles, prophets, um, teachers, pastors, uh, evangelists. It's not, they're not just, they're not the un- ones with those gifts are not the only ones that are just called to be, live a life worthy of the calling. It actually, they were just gifts given to the church to build the church, to live a life worthy of the calling that we've received. Ephesians 4 is telling us that we have this life that we must live worthy of the calling that we've received. These gifts um, are, are about, about building up the body. It goes on to say, uh, it talks about us so that we would find Christian maturity. 1 Corinthians 12.4 puts it this way. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. If I'm, a, if I'm on a horse right now with my face blue, belting out a song with a sky, belting out a, a, a call with a Scottish accent, I am saying there are different kinds of gifts. But the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different services, but we serve the same God. I would that I would be belting out and say, so a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other, so that we can serve Christ. It's that important. And would you give every day from this day to that, to your final day, for this chance to live out this time with our gifting? It's not a, it's not just an exercise of, um, I guess, oh, I wonder how I'm gifted. It's not a LinkedIn exercise. It's an exercise of living out a life worthy of the calling we received. I read these words of D.L. Moody. And this is something, um, th- you think about that, your diversity. Think about your gifting, what you're bringing to the kingdom of God and the body of Christ when I read these words. So what L. Moody said, I know my own heart today. I would rather die than live as I once did, a mere nominal Christian and not used by God in building up his kingdom. It seems a poor, empty life to live for the sake of self. Let us seek to be useful. Let us seek to be vessels, meeting for the for the master's use, that God, the Holy Spirit, might shine fully through us. <sighs> There you go. That's Dwight L. Moody on a horse declaring, Let, let's, let's not live a meaningless life, but let's embrace how we've been designed, a life worthy of the calling we received, called by God to use our gifts in the unity and of, of the body of Christ. Fifth thing is called by God to maturity in Christ. Paul then goes on, and this is the reason why we use our gifts. This is the reason why we display God's character. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and the knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every kind of wind or every wind or new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his his body, the church. Christ is the head of our church. Part of being worthy of our calling is growing. Remember week one? Growing. The first G was growing, which connects us with God. Our first G in the series was growing. And that's what we're meant to be doing. Worthy of our calling is growing in Christ. And then, our, then we talked about gathering with others. 
as the body as the body body grows in love. These five G season was all about building our passion to become followers of Jesus Christ all the more in very practical ways. So that we will all become mature in the faith, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. That's Ephesians 4 saying that's what we need to do. That, that, that's why he moved, as, as John Stott beautifully put it, he moved from, do, from, from doctrine to, to duty, to calling. I beg you, Paul says, I beg you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Called by God to maturity in Christ. In Christ, remember, it's in Christ. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, of this body, the church. And the final thing we hear Paul calling us to, this God, God calling us, or Paul saying God calling us to, is to a body of love. Verse 16, he makes the whole body fit, fit together perfectly. All the bits, all the giftings, all the character, um, it all fits together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. There is nothing in the LinkedIn app or the LinkedIn social media network, which is saying, we do all this so that we are healthy and growing and full of love. It's a beautiful picture of diversity, but, there's, but, but it brings everybody together for a purpose, not to actually grow together in love. That's the difference between the Bible and, and the many things that call us to actually recognize who we are. These are good things. LinkedIn is. Understand who you are. All that sort of stuff. But when Jesus gets involved, it comes to something much more powerful. It's done in Christ. It's a gift that we know these gifts are given to us by God. But for the goal of the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Did you know that every spiritual gift passage in the Bible, 1 Peter 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, and here in Ephesians 4, have love passages right around it or right through it, just like we read then. Famous one is 1 Corinthians 13, which sits right smack bang in the middle of 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, which talk about spiritual gift. Our... Uh, our, our gifting will build the church. It will grow the church. It will expand the church. It will make the church healthy. And I get really excited about that. But ultimately, the result will be one church full of love. The greatest evangelistic tool we have to express Christ is through people. Jesus chose that. In Acts 1.8, he says, you will be my witnesses. In 2 Corinthians 5, you will be my ambassadors. In Matthew 28, go into the world and make disciples, as Scott talked about last week. In 1 Peter 3.15, get ready, give testimony, the hope that you have within you. The church, the body of Christ, us, each one of us. Remember, those fivefold giftings, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, were, to build, were given gifts to the church to build the church, to equip the saints for us all to live out our divine purpose, our calling, called by God, and for us to live worthy of our calling. The greatest evangelistic tool that God has in his hands is us. We do it through the power of the Spirit. You will receive power and the Spirit comes on my eye and you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of earth. So it's really important. It's a brave heart moment. Not just a good idea. It's a brave heart moment. Would you give every, from years from now, dying in your beds, would you give every day from this day to that for just this chance to take our lives, to give our lives, The Holy Spirit orchestrates the body. He gives the gifts. He's like the conductor. And he brings all the gifts together as one in the, in the divine orchestra. On cue for one noise, one declaration that Jesus is Lord. And as 1 Corinthians 13 says, without love, 
It's just a racket, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. God is orchestrating us into his church. He has gift, divinely gifted us and it connects us with the calling on our lives. Let's go all the way back to the first verse. Therefore, I urge you. Imagine Paul in chains writing this letter to the church, churches in Ephesus. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to live to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. You've been called by God to character, to unity of the Christian faith, to the body. You've been called under the authority of Jesus Christ. You've been called to engage your diversity of gifting. You've been called to maturity in Christ. And above all, you've been called to a body of love. Let's take our place in Christ's church. Let's take our place in Christ's church and live out the calling that God has placed on our lives. If you would like some help uh, understanding your unique gifting and your agenda, I'll do my best to help. Um, I'll do my best to help. But the, the great helper is the Holy Spirit. And if you turn to the Lord and you ask him to reveal to you your, the, the agenda he has for your life, you just might be surprised what he asks you to do. A good friend of mine once said, um, God, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. And I love that. But we've got to prepare to be called. We've got to be prepared to live out the life worthy of the calling we've received. We've got to accept that we've been called by God, each and every one of us. And this passage goes very deeply and the whole of Ephesians actually goes very deeply to say there's no one not in this your cultural diversity um, your your capacity your intellectual capacity your emotional capacity your relational all those things um, they don't disqualify us from the calling of God he redeems what needs to be redeemed he empowers us by the power of the spirit each one special gift remember that all right, okay, that's enough for me talking. I hope that um, you've been stirred by God today to, to live a life worthy of the calling you received, which involves the, your character, which involves your gifting, which involves your commitment to the body of Christ, that, that other G gathering, which involves building the body up in love. It involves humility, pay, all those things. Let's live out a life worthy of the calling we received. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I, I think I look at... Um, I'm just, uh, just going to open my eyes. I look at this Dwight Moody comment. Let us seek to be useful. Let us seek to be vessels, meaning for the master's youth, that God, the Holy Spirit, might shine fully through us. Lord, I pray that you would shine fully through us. And it will be no longer we that live, but you that live in us, Jesus Christ. And I pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for being part of this series. I hope it's been really helpful. I encourage you to keep revisiting these five Gs. Uh